In today's episode, we talked a lot about how various ways of cooking can impact the nutrient availability in our foods, including water-soluble vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins, and minerals. So take a listen. We talk about everything from steaming to roasting to frying to grilling, water-based cooking, and more, and we hope that you enjoy the episode. You hear all the bull about diet and exercise. Carbs are evil. Do more cardio. Never eat bread or cookies again. Just do a juice cleanse. We get it. We fell for all of the BS too. It's time to go right to the source with the truth about how to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. I am Liz. And I'm Becca. We are your nutrition educators and this is The Food Code. We are back in the studio today. I know. You know what's really funny? Nick, yesterday, last night, he goes, so you're going to Liz's tomorrow? Are you excited to go and see your best friend? And I was like, I haven't seen her in a really long time. I was like, I mean, we talk, he goes, a lot. You talk all the time. And when you're not talking, you're texting each other. (laughs) I was like... We do talk about, but like, there's just so many things in our life that like, I have other friends, but they don't understand because they don't have kids. Yeah. And I mean, like Liz and I talk about business. We talk about our kids. We talk about our husbands. We talk about everything. Yeah. So, like, it's just like Liz is my person. That's, that's who I talk to about literally like everyone has to have a person that they mm-hmm. talk to and they feel comfortable talking to about anything. Yep. And I share things with you that I don't share with anybody else. Like my insecurities, like yeah. I texted her last night and said, I really need to take a knife cooking skills <laughs> class because I'm ma- making these cooking videos. And I don't know if you get this way, but like I get nervous knowing the camera is on and I'm like trying to chop and I'm probably holding the knife wrong and don't look at all like a professional chef. But I have just embraced that I am not a very skilled chef. I, I make things that taste good, but you know, and my husband's been recovering from COVID and he still has no taste or smell really. And so he'll like be like, this is really good tonight. And I'm like, you can't even taste what I just made. How are you even, how can you say that it tastes good? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, then he has no excuse to go out to eat because what's the point of going out to eat if you can't taste Believe it? Me. I don't know. He still manages it. He <laughs> ate chicken wings last night before dinner. Leftover chicken wings from the weekend. <laughs> Well, maybe in his mind, he just... Yeah, I'm sure he remembers how they taste. He says he can taste spice, like he can mm-hmm. taste some spices um, and stuff like that. And then he has like small... Hit, like he tried... He smells everything in the house right now. Like he smells candles multiple times a day to see if his smell is back. Um, he smelled my perfume bottle the other day. He's like, I can kind of smell this. So I don't know. Hopefully it'll be back very soon and not skewed. Because like I know my brother-in-law is still says there's some things that mm-hmm. smell funny and just certain things that taste like soap still yeah and he had covid almost two years ago yeah that's crazy so crazy crazy so today is going to be i would consider today like a fun fact podcast Mm -hmm. because we're going to talk about cooking methods um and all the different fun facts about all the different cooking methods i actually learned quite a bit as i was reading through notes for today i was like oh I didn't know that. And I think hopefully this will remind you of some new ways you can try and cook um, and give you some information on like what oils you should be cooking with when you are cooking at different temperatures and all of that good stuff. So we're going to talk about the best ways to cook for maximum nutrient absorption. Yes, because we know that there's a lot of people out there who say that, you know, you just need to eat everything raw. And here's the thing. I'll be honest. I don't like raw vegetables. Like to sit down and want to eat celery and cucumber and broccoli. I don't know. It's just not my jam. And so, you know, I was at the gym this morning and forgot my headphones, forgot my water bottle. It was a disaster, but I had a really great workout. (laughs) Probably a good thing that I forgot both of those things because then I could actually pay attention and focus. But I was thinking about, you know, all of the things that I've learned through cooking, both with writing the Fit Cookery Cookbook and then also just as we've been, you know, doing more cooking videos lately. And I'm like, There are so many things that we get questions about from our clients. I thought this would be a really good topic to share in terms of, like Becca said, like what are the oils and what temperature, you know, should you be cooking things at? And, you know, what about the loss of vitamins and minerals when foods are cooked a certain way? 
And so, yes, raw foods can be great for some individuals. However, if they're not palatable to you and you never want to eat them, I would rather you eat a good stir fry or cooked vegetables or make an awesome soup and get those nutrients in than just avoiding them, you know, altogether. And then the other piece of this too is for some people with digestive issues, they can't tolerate Mm -hmm. large amounts of raw vegetables and stuff. So I thought that would be, you know, something that we would, you know, kind of covered today as well and share some tips and tricks for you. So again, before we dive into this, as Andy Forsella says on his podcast, we need you to pay your dues. Yes. Please like, share, rate the podcast, tag a friend. You know, this is something that everybody can gain benefit from because Everybody cooks in some way, shape, or form. We hope. Well, we hope, yeah. We hope that everyone cooks. Um, So I know Liz kind of mentioned raw foods, and there is such thing as like a raw food diet, um, and there are people that are zealots for raw food diets. There also is a large benefit to cooking foods, especially meat foods that can have illness, like um, foodborne illnesses and stuff like that to help prevent those things like fire and cooking was a very good development in human nature. And we want to be thankful for that. So you do not need to eat raw foods. Um, But there are some downsides to cooking and especially cooking certain methods. Um, So cooking can actually reduce antioxidant content. And it also may increase the levels of carcinogens and oxidized fats in food, uh, depending on like the method, the temperature, the ingredients that get used. So Heat can actually break down and destroy 15 to 20 percent of some vitamins and vegetables, especially vitamin C and B vitamins, as they are water soluble and can destroy folate and potassium. So when you're cooking in water, we're going to kind of get to each of the methods of cooking and, you know, the highlights of like what benefits are, what the cons are. Um, So you can kind of decide. But we will talk about all of that so that you can figure out what's the easiest way to cook. I know for me, I was like, oh, I haven't done that type of cooking in a while. Maybe I should go back to that. So hopefully this will also spur some creativity around your cooking right now um, because each method kind of has a pro and con. So we're going to run through them right now. Um, But other studies just really fast before we dive into these um, in terms of certain foods, but then like the benefit from cooking, because I mentioned that there are some downsides to cooking foods when cooking carrots spinach, tomatoes, heat facilitates the release of certain antioxidants by breaking down the cellular walls of those. And it provides an easier passage for the good guys from food to body. So know that like not all cooking is bad in terms of antioxidant and vitamins. Um, It's just certain things help with the digestion of food and help with the absorption of those nutrients. Other things can break down and impact that. So we're going to kind of dive into those details. Yep. Yeah. And what comes to my mind here initially is like for people who struggle maybe to break down, digest and absorb beans, for example, right? They they have um, lectins on the outside of them. And a lot of plant-based foods do have various protective mechanisms Mm -hmm. because that is in nature for them to prevent being killed and eaten by, you know, other bugs and things things like that. And so for certain, let's say like really rough vegetables, I think Brussels sprouts, I think kale, you know, some of those really, um, like think if you were going to just eat it raw, it's hard to chew, right? It's hard to break down even in your mouth through the chewing process. Mm -hmm. So those things you're going to do a lot better in terms of overall digestion and absorption of the nutrients in those foods. If you can help your digestive system by cooking them adequately, I like to use, you know, my pressure cooker, which we'll dive into that as well. Um, and that can help from a digestive perspective because I do know a lot of people avoid foods or certain food groups because they can't, you know, tolerate them digestively. They either get gas or bloating, Mm -hmm. upset stomach, right? More sulfurous vegetables, things like that too. So if we can cook our food in a different manner, then we can increase the variety of foods that we can consume, which increases enjoyment, Mm -hmm. right? But it also gives us more nutrient availability, even if we lost a little bit of, you know, the nutritional profile. So let's dive into the different types of cooking methods. So first, I think this one is very, very common, um, grilling and broiling. So this involves dry heat to cook a food, right? And grilling the heat source comes from underneath, right? If you are cooking with this, a... This I did not know. I was reading this and I was like, I mean, I guess I knew it, but like mm-hmm. it putting like grilling is from the bottom, broiling is from the top. Yep. 
Yeah. Um, And unfortunately, the same heat that produces the great flavor also contributes, though, to the formation of toxic compounds. Okay, so I was actually listening to uh, another doctor talk about um, certain different like certain grills and what actually happens when the fat drips down and catches fire, that is a carcinogen then. Interesting. That's what makes it so tasty though. So this is true though, because the same heat that like makes the food and have that flavor contributes to that. Mm -hmm. So there are some toxic compounds and I'm going to do my best pronouncing, pronouncing these toxic compounds. I don't really understand why science has to make words so long and confusing, but here we go. Acrylamide is known for toxic effects on fertility in the nervous system. That's one compound that can, can, re, can get created. Polycyclic or aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, so these are pH, PAHs basically. Um, and basically you can get them from cereals and vegetables. So like when vegetables are grilled over an open flame, um, they are present in soil and in ambient air. So ambient air. Exposure has been linked with cancer, cardiovascular disease, and poor fetal development. And then advanced glyca- glycation end products. These are called, called ages. Okay, These are a little bit more commonly known. Um, and they're proteins or lipids that have become glycated as a result of exposure to sugars. Okay, So this was what I think of like if you use barbecue sauce or if you mm-hmm. use something on top of a meat. Um, and these compounds are known for creating oxidative damage and accelerating the aging process. Here's the bottom line, guys. The amount that you would need to consume, though. So, like, this is where I would I would say a lot of times people will come out with, like, fear-mongering articles mm-hmm. around you shouldn't grill your food because it causes cancer. They pull from these studies. They pull from these that are, like, you would need to eat 500 times the amount of a normal diet of it to get these negative things happening from the food. So... The, the World Health Organization, the WHO, has also come out with like stating that you would need to consume very large amounts to get the exposure to cause damage. So although some of these might have like correlation to some toxic compounds, there is no like causation that, mm-hmm. you know, a study has proven if you grill your food, you're going to get cancer type thing. Yeah. Well, I just, when I was reading through this earlier, I was thinking back to when I used to grill in college and, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing then. I was just trying to make a hamburger, you know, or a steak. And and sometimes when that fire would get too hot Mm -hmm. and a lot of the grease would, you know, fall down or, you know, it was really, really smoking is that really healthy for us? And so maybe this comes down to let's just change the way that you grill or the way that you grill and you're not burning things to a crisp, Mm -hmm. right? We don't want to have all of that char on the outside of our meat. Plus nobody wants to eat dry meat anyways. Um, So I think that can be something to take away from this is just be mindful, you know, get a drip pan. If you, depending upon the type of grill that you're grilling on, um, if you grill a lot, make sure that maybe you're just lowering the temp or you know, getting a drip pan. So not all of that is burning back up onto your food. Yep. The next one that we're going to talk about is steaming. So anything from fresh vegetables to fish allows them to cook in their own juices and retain all of the natural goodness. Okay. So again, here's a benefit of steaming that we don't need to pour a bunch of fat onto, you know, our meat or veggies or fish. So if you're following, let's say a moderately low fat, you know, let's say above 50 grams per day. Like I know for me, if I'm having other sources of fat or the meat that I'm consuming itself has fat in it, I'm not generally adding more fat. Mm-hmm. And I usually consume around 60 to 70 grams of fat a day. We recommend no less than 50 grams of fat um, for women a day because we need it to build our hormones. Um, so we're not talking about low fat here, but we do know that in certain cooking methods, you are going to have more fat if you're cooking with a lot of butter, oils, things like that, which we'll get into. But Steaming is always a good way because we can add a little seasoning, you know, first to the water, whether it's, uh, you know, a good pink Himalayan sea salt, another colored salt. Um, The colored salts are going to provide us with more minerals. So I use that instead of just regular, you know, Mm -hmm. white table salt. Um, But you could also add in like lemon juice or depending upon what you're making, like I've been doing more juice from oranges for certain meats and things like that. But Steaming is basically going to allow you to cook your food without emerging it into water. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that um, here in a little bit. But basically, when you emerge vegetables into water, we do lose some of the vitamin B and vitamin C vitamins that are in that uh, food because they are water soluble vitamins. And unless you are utilizing the juice that you are like boiling something in, you will lose that 15 to 20 Mm -hmm. percent. Yep. And there are one downside to steaming 
does not taste great. Yes. Steaming vegetables, steamed vegetables are not my favorite. So add some seasoning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Roasting and baking. Um, roasting and baking both involve cooking in an oven with dry heat. Uh, roasting is obviously things like meats, vegetables, baking baked goods, you know, bread products, stuff like that. Um, vitamin and mineral losses are pretty minimal with moderate temperature roasting or baking. Some B vitamins may be lost in the meat drippings, which is why basting can actually be very beneficial. Or if you wanted to use those juices to make like a gravy, um, but otherwise you lose the vitamins that seep off in the meat drippings. Um, pretty simple with roasting and baking. It's pretty great. Uh, it just causes some with a little bit of whatever comes off. And then stir frying and sauteing. Stir frying and sauteing, food is cooked in a saucepan or a skillet over medium to high heat in a relatively small amount of oil or like other form of fat. Um, and this improves the absorption of fat soluble vitamins and antioxidants. Um, cooking without water and for like a shorter time helps us actually retain those B vitamins better. But you do want to watch out for high heat, which can destroy like the unstable compounds within these foods. Um, and it can also cause the formation of those ages and the acrylamide, which we talked about with the grilling. So you just want, I usually always make sure that I'm keeping it over like relatively medium heat and not causing any burning of oils or burning of fats before I add in the food. You mean like the three times that we set the fire alarm off cooking at our resort this past weekend wasn't a good idea? <laughs> Sometimes I just believe that people put the fire alarm in a bad place. Like yeah. my parents' house goes off with anything. Mm -hmm. At our old house, it would go off with anything. Yeah. You got to put them in the right place. Like yes. Cooking is going to create some form of steam that can set off a fire alarm. We need to be we need to be smart. Yes. Well, we were making bacon, and so that's oh, yeah. always you know producing more smoke. But the fan on the microwave above the stove didn't go anywhere. It wasn't vented to the outside, mm -hmm. so it was just recirculating into the room. And then yes, one hundred percent, the fire um, or the smoke detector was like. I don't know, five feet away from the stove. I don't so even know where ours is in our kitchen. I haven't even paid attention mm, to where it is in probably, the kitchen. Probably find it. I um, mean, I'm sure it's somewhere that it needs to be. I just like, have never paid attention. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So speaking of uh, smoke, let's talk about frying. So frying involves cooking food at a very high temperature in a large amount of fat. Typically, this is oil, right? You go out to eat, you eat fried mm -hmm. foods, you're probably you know, consuming a lot of canola oil or safflower oil, some of those higher um, heat cooking oils. And it's popular because because the skin or the bread coating forms a seal, ensuring that the inside remains, everybody's favorite word, moist, and cooks evenly throughout. And frying can preserve vitamin B uh, and C because, again, there's no water involved. However, it can turn otherwise healthy food, like vegetables, right, into an inflammatory nightmare because we're cooking in inflammatory oils since those oils have a higher smoke point, which we're going to cover as well. And so really eating fried foods just results in consuming harmful compounds. Yep. Not great for health. No. Um, and then if you think about like, I think about my childhood and how my parents usually like reheated and reused oil, right? Like they do in fast food restaurants. Yeah. Or I would reheat the food that I got from mm -hmm. places that was fried. Yep. And that further increases the um, aldehyde and the ages content as we talked about before. And so what we recommend is get yourself an air fryer. Best, best investment ever. Yep. It can give you about 80% of the experience, but there's no added oils and there's no unhealthy toxins. Plus, if you're, you know, watching the fats, then, you know, there's mm -hmm. less fat content in there. And I do everything in my air fryer. We do everything. Sweet potatoes, fries. Reheating fried food. If you really want to reheat fried food, put it in the air fryer. Yep. It, oh my gosh. I know that like we just talked about how it's not great for you to reheat fried food. But if you want and you got some maybe delicious French fries from a restaurant and you want to experience those again. Or believe it or not, a little fun fact that I've learned. Um, fresh tortilla chips, if they go mm -hmm. a little bad, you put them in the air fryer. They taste like new. Yeah. I actually made tortilla chips uh, or sorry, tortilla strips out of white corn tortillas mm -hmm. for a soup that I made not too long ago. And it was perfect. And mm -hmm. honestly, you could cut that into, you know, four or six and make your own chips out of the white corn tortillas if you didn't have any chips in the house, but you wanted it for something. Um, I do salmon in the air fryer. We do veggies mm -hmm. in the air fryer. We do other meats. Chicken thighs are delicious in the air fryer. Mm -hmm. They just make a lot of smoke. I've learned that the hard way. 
well, my entire kitchen. Your your kitchen is apparently not going to catch listen, on fire. I like could barely see through my kitchen. There was so much smoke and no fire alarm was going off. So maybe I should be concerned. I don't know. Um, okay, water-based <laughs> cooking. Water-based cooking includes things like poaching, simmering, and boiling. Really short, funny story. Every time I ask Nick what he wants for breakfast, he's like, eggs benedict, poached eggs. And I'm like, I'm not making eggs benedict. I'm never making you eggs benedict because it's a pain in the butt to make. Mm-hmm. And every time... This just reminded me of that every time I hear, every time I ask him what he wants for breakfast, if I make him breakfast, <laughs> some ridiculous thing. Um, but anyways, water-based cooking includes poaching, simmering, and boiling. All three of these methods use water to heat the food, but differ in the temperature use. So poaching is very low, less than 180 degrees. Simmering is like 180 to 200 degrees, and boiling is 212 plus degrees Fahrenheit. Um, elevated temperatures and a large volume of water, like Liz talked about earlier, actually can wash away many of the vitamins and some of the minerals in certain foods. So if you consume the liquid, you get these vitamins and minerals back, but like soups and stews, that's not a concern. Everything else, no one's really drinking the liquid that they're or consuming the liquid that they're cooking within. So, yeah, like I think about, you know, in the past when I have done like broccoli and I've, you know, boiled that, the water turns green. That's yeah. a lot of the vitamins and minerals, mm-hmm. you know, seeping out into the water and I'm not using that water to make no. anything with. So, here is where you do lose some of the benefits of your vitamins and minerals. Mm-hmm. Again, guys, we're not talking about that everything is totally depleted, but the more you know, the better you can do, right? Yep. So let's talk about slow cushing, cooking and pressure cooking, one of our favorite things. We always mm-hmm. talk about our Instant Pots, right? Um, so clo- slow cooking is going to be done in a crock pot, right? It's that gentle method of cooking. Again, indicates the word slow indicates that it is a longer period of time and therefore um you know it let me go back (laughs) all right so let's talk about slow cooking and pressure cooking one of our favorite ways to cook in the house and this really kind of is self-explanatory slow cooking usually done in a crock pot low temperature takes longer um, and that temperature is below that boiling point of water so 212 degrees or less Pressure cooking is similar to slow cooking, but typically uses a higher temperature and a shorter amount of time. And there's been many studies regarding the nutrient retention of food prepared in slow cookers, but it's reasonable to assume that some nutrients are going to be lost when we are pressure cooking things. Now, here's what I will say about this. My pressure cooker, like usually I'm making like meats or you know, roast in there, soup, stews, things like that. So I don't get concerned because again, I'm going to be consuming all of the liquid that is remaining with the food, right? Because I'm either eating a soup or a stew, or I'm usually turning some of the liquid left over from a roast into like some sort of sauce or gravy. But pressure cooking specifically for some of those rough vegetables or beans, legumes, things like that, if you're struggling to break down, digest, and absorb them without digestive backlash, pressure cooking is going to be the way to go because that high heat will actually break down and kill off some of those um, nutrients that the plant has, the Mm -hmm. compounds, excuse me, that the plants have to defend, you know, other invaders from eating them. So this can be for people with digestive issues, a really great way for you to test and see Mm -hmm. if you can, you know, tolerate these things if they're just cooked a little bit differently. The Food Code Podcast is brought to you by Fit Mom Lifestyle. If you're interested in our individualized coaching that we always talk about and how we may be able to help you like we help our clients in accomplishing optimal health and losing weight and achieving their goals, you can click the link in the show notes and you can actually schedule a free 15 to 20 minute call with either of us. We would love to talk to you. Yep. And that's something that I've found and I've mentioned before is like, I don't tolerate high amounts of Brussels sprouts, but I can do them shaved because they are broken down more. My body doesn't have to do as much work. I don't get as much bad of gas from them. Like we have to understand that the biggest thing, the plants are trying to protect themselves with these protective compounds, but it's hard for our body to break them down. So the more we can break them down, like broccoli chopped very small and then cooked in the pressure cooker or cooked, you know, down quite a bit to where they're almost like mushy um, is probably the best way to reintroduce foods that you have previously had reactions to. So Next up is microwaving. And microwaving gets a bad rep, okay? It's one of the safest methods of cooking, actually. So microwaves emit radio waves that cause water molecules in the food to kind of resonate. And this generates heat, cooking the food from the inside out. The shorter cooking times and more evening heating from the inside out helps preserve the nutrients in microwave food. Plus, it's extremely convenient. (laughs) The downside is that microwave 
can leave unpleasant, you know, dry, soggy, rubbery, but there's no evidence that microwaves are unsafe, actually. Um, of course, don't stand like directly in front of the microwave while it's running amidst those um, radio waves, but also use a glass container. Um, this is a big thing that we don't want, unfortunately, like the BPAs and the toxins and chemicals found in common Tupperware stuff can seep into your food. So always use grass, glass Tupperware. I always tell people like, if you've just cooked something and are putting it in Tupperware and it's hot, put glass Tupperware. Use plastic Tupperware for things like fruits and salads and things that are cooler that you're not heating or allowing to cool in that Tupperware. So sometimes I'll even put like um, if I've cooked something and I don't have any glass left because I only have so many glass containers, um, I'll put it in a glass bowl or like a, you know, actual uh, ceramic bowl. And then once it's cooled enough, I'll put it into a Tupperware container. And then when I heat it again, I put it back into a bowl that I can heat it in. So just a little tip. Um, so that's the kind of only downside of microwaving, but microwaving actually is very safe and it retains a lot of the nutrients because it doesn't, you know, and nothing seeps out. It's all pretty much contained within the food. So last thing we want to talk about is oils. Um, and this is something that kind of like a lot of people don't think about, but oils have what's known as a smoke or a burning point. Um, and every oil has like a slightly different temperature that it, it starts to release toxic chemicals and compounds um, into the food once it's reached that boiling point or I'm sorry, that smoke point. And so some things you want to bake with because baking is often done at lower temperatures, 350, 325, stuff like that. Um, And then other things, if you're like, you know, stir frying, grilling, things that are very high temperatures, you would want to use different types of oils and butters. Yep. So let's talk about the higher smoke points first. I think a lot of people, they get caught up with like, extra virgin olive oil, right? And really, we want to keep extra virgin olive oil for colder things like 325 to 375. That's the highest um, temp point for that. Salad dressings. Right. (laughs) Yep. Use it for cold things, dressings, um, marinades, things like that. But you can use light and refined olive oil all the way up to 465 degrees. Safflower oil has the highest smoke point. That's 510 degrees. Um, I personally don't cook with safflower oil. I try to stick with olive oils. Um, I usually do beef tallow or lard or ghee as well. Um, And then coconut oil or clarified butter, grass-fed butter. Those are all pretty safe to use at higher cook points. Um, And then really anything else, I, I just stay away from because there's so many different types of oils out there now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are full of omega-6s. And I don't want all of that, you know, inflammatory oil in my food. So I do stay away from, even when I go out to eat, it's like, I want to minimize the exposure to the oils that they're using because they're using soybean oil, corn oil, sunflower oil, vegetable oil, those lower quality oils because they're cheap, right? Mm -hmm. And because they have high smoke points. And they use a ton of them at restaurants. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you think they cook all their food in? So absolutely. I also will use avocado oil, but avocado oil also only has 400 degree burn point. So Mm -hmm. it's not super high either. Um, So we just want to kind of make sure that when we are using those things, we are using the right oils uh, for the right things. Coconut oil is only 350 degrees. Um, So a lot of people will sometimes use coconut oil to cook with. Coconut oil doesn't have a high burn point. So it will start to release those chemicals and those toxins at a low burn point. Um, So just something to kind of remember if you're trying to really reach for the healthier oils, Think about if you're cooking at high heats, refined or light olive oil. Um, And then like Liz was saying, beef tallow, ghee, lard, stuff Mm -hmm. like that can be very, very helpful for that. Um, So last thing we kind of want to talk through is cooking different types of foods um, and why we cook them, what, you know, it does for the foods when we cook them. So we're going to start with meat. Um, And when we think about meat and kind of other pro. Uh, proteins, we think about the digestibility of the protein, the amount of vitamin B vitamins and minerals, and the absence of inflammatory compounds. Um, And so cooking meat and other proteins obviously significantly improves their digestibility. That's a huge thing that (laughs) we want to make sure of um, because meat can be hard to break down. And that's why we often talk about chewing your food at least 15 to 20 times when you're chewing especially things that are tougher in terms of meat, like steaks tend to be a little bit tougher. Um, So we always recommend chewing them as much as possible because you can get them broken down as much as possible before they go into your digestive tract. Yes. By the way, have you seen the raw meat eater on Instagram? I don't know if I want to see the raw meat eater. It's disgusting. He literally is eating raw meat for every meal of the day. 
And you know what I bet? And people like that, he has probably developed the ability to tolerate those things. His, his body has probably worked to create different enzymes, to create different things that allow for that digestibility. I just, and some people can just tolerate it. Yeah. I just think about like parasites and know. you know other things that I think there is a lot of benefit to cooking. There's a reason why we cook our food, okay? Um, but Dr. Chris Kresser actually shared in one of his recent articles um, why scientists believe the increased energy and raw protein building blocks extracted from cooked meat was what fueled the development of human brains as they are today. And so one example in the study that they looked at was cooked eggs versus raw eggs. You guys remember Arnold Schwarzenegger with his raw eggs, right? Um, but what they found in the research is that protein in cooked eggs is 180% more digestible than protein in raw eggs. So it's one thing to actually eat a certain amount of protein. It's another thing to be able to break down, digest, and absorb it and put it to use in the body. So that was just a fun fact kind of you know, from the research that I was reading from him, again, that's Dr. Chris Kresser. Um, and then we look at the B vitamin content of meat, which greatly depends on the cooking method used, as we just talked about, right? Because of those varying um, temperatures that are used during cooking. So B vitamins, water soluble, meaning they can easily get washed out. Um, so this is why we don't boil meat. We don't cook meat in water. Um, and so for me, when we're doing, you know, steaks and things like that, we're usually grilling it or the latest thing because it's winter here and our grill is, you know, outdoors and it's, um, not wanting to start right now, we're doing a lot of basting. So I just posted um, a video this week. We did carne asada tacos last night. We did a lot of basting with the uh, clarified butter because that, again, has a higher um, smoke point. And so that's what we use along with the other seasonings and herbs to cook it in the skillet. Mm -hmm. And with long cooking times at high temperature, the B vitamins and like roasted, grilled or broiled meat may decline as much as 40%. Um, so roasting is a good option because then you can collect and, you know, baste with those meat juices juices with grilling the drippings and the nutrients they contain are often lost. Um, but still these may be better than like water-based methods, simmering, um, you know, what we talked about earlier, uh, totally blanking. Losing B and C vitamins. In well, water. yes, it's simmering or I'm trying to not sous vide because sous vide is great because it cooks within water, but the juices are contained within the package that you do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but other types of poached, that's poached. what I was thinking. Poached. <laughs> poached protein cooks, um, you lose a lot of these B vitamins. Um, so simmering has been shown to result in the loss of up to 60% of B vitamins. So when you are cooking your meat, you want to be making sure that you are using methods that allow you to keep a lot of this sauteing, roasting, grilling, and kind of re repurposing those drippings on top of the meat to help maintain that. Um, so few studies have been done on minerals in cooked meats. We just talked about vitamins, but there is a general consensus that mineral minerals are reasonably like retained within the meat. Manganese, copper, iron, zinc are thought to be most stable. Um, one study found that these minerals in pork loin increased in content actually uh, with boiling, but subsequently decreased if cooking was carried on to, to high of temperatures. So this is why we don't want to overcook our meat I should listen to my advice. Um, I'm totally like my husband hates the way that I like my meat. He's like, something is wrong with you. And I, it bothers me to cook it this way. <laughs> I'm medium rare all the way. See, I like a little bit more close to medium. I, I don't like when it's like mushy because I feel like rare steaks are like more mushy. Mm -hmm. That bothers me. Yeah. And I will eat my chicken dry as a freaking toothpick. Like, and it drives him crazy. I don't prefer it that way, but like, I don't mind it. And so he gets really upset. And every time he grills my chicken and when I like have a meal prep my chicken, I cut into them to make sure that they're like cooked to the way that I want. Well, and he gets really upset. You don't, you don't want to see any pink in the center. No, not know? at all. Not at all. But I also like, I don't like mushy meat. And so I don't want my burger like mm -hmm. with a ton of red. That's why I prefer turkey burgers because like they tend to be more cooked. Um, but anyways... <laughs> You don't, you want to find that sweet spot for meat. You don't want to overcook it. So maybe I should learn to like different things. But he like literally, he's like, it's not done right. And I'm like, well, that's how I want it. So for me, it's right. I need you to get over it. 
That's or else I'm it, just going to put it in the microwave. <laughs> That's how it is when we go to Art's parents' house. Like Art mm-hmm. wants his rare, practically mooing. Mm-hmm. And his dad and I are both more on the medium rare. Mostly his dad is usually medium. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's like one steak comes off, a couple more minutes, then the next steak comes off, yep. and a couple more minutes, the next steak comes off. But anyways, um, fun fact, though, as we wrap up meat, When we are marinating our meats prior to cooking them, we can actually reduce the amount of ages and HCAs that are formed. So if you've not done this, you start marinating your meat. Um, I was reading another article. uh, Actually, I was sorry. It was in the book that I've been reading, Salt, Acid, Fat, and Heat. They were talking about acid in marinades. Mm -hmm. So, you know, citric juices, apple cider vinegars, things like that, and how beneficial they are. Um, And then another one related to salt was salting your meat and letting it dry age in your fridge for a few days before cooking it. Um, so I got to practice that a little bit more. I did it once. The meat that I did it on wasn't the best. So I want to try it with some of the stuff mm-hmm. from Butcher Box mm-hmm. because I'm sure that um, that's going to change the flavor and the profile yeah. tremendously with Maybe that we'll dry do that aging. With the fil- We're doing fillets. The one, the one qualm I have with Butcher Box fillets, they're tiny. Mm-hmm. They're only four ounces. We get ribeyes. Pretty much, mm-hmm. I don't deviate from ribeyes. I usually do four ribeyes and then to pick two other things because oh. ribeyes here are so expensive. Wait, see, I don't like ribeyes because again, I don't like fatty proteins. Yeah. They're just like, they're not my jam. It's just, I don't know. Love me a good ribeye with some blue cheese. Yeah. I put the blue cheese on the fillets. We mm. put the blue cheese on the fillets, a little bit of blue cheese. Nick mixes it with like some breadcrumbs. Mm. It's really good. So yummy, yummy. bless my husband for putting up with my weird food things. Um, but anyways, so last thing we're going to talk on, touch on is actually resistant starch and fermentation. Um, so cooking and cooling, certain things can cause them to turn into a resistant starch. Resistant starches are very beneficial because they are actually able to pass through the digestive tract without being altered and they can help with digestion and bowel movements. Um, and so not everything can become a resistant starch. There's very few things actually that can become resistant starches. So one thing we've talked a little bit about is cooking and cooling white sushi rice. It actually has to be a particular type of rice. Um, and white potatoes causes some of their starch to convert. It basically crystallizes during that cooling process and becomes a resistant starch. Um, This is one instance where frying may be beneficial as frying potatoes also actually converts the starch into resistant starch, which feeds good gut bacteria and it has a lower glycemic index. So there's the benefits of resistant starch on top of the digestion digestion aspect and the the bowel movements that it can assist with. Um, And then fermentation... While not technically a cooking method, fermentation dramatically changes the health profile of food. So the biggest benefit of fermentation is, of course, the probiotic bacteria. A lot of people hear about fermented foods helping with probiotics. But fermentation also increases vitamin K2 content and may reduce pesticide burden. Um, So, of course, fermentation can also increase the histamine content of food. It's kind of like a double-edged sword here. Um, But it may this can be like an issue with people that have a histamine intolerance or mast cell activation disorder. Um, Not... Everyone has histamine issues. It's it's actually quite, you know, it's not like a very common thing. Um, but those are also things that can be beneficial with types of food preparation that you're doing. Yeah. Fermentation is one of my favorites, like glassing or canning. Mm-hmm. Um, and you do that with, you know, a vinegar source, obviously with some water. And then you just add your spices. We love making homemade pickles out of cucumbers in the garden in the, you know, summertime. And so again, we're thinking about what were our ancestors doing? Because our ancestors were not dealing with the obesity, you know, pandemic, all of the diseases, autoimmune conditions, gut health issues that we have today. And so there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from them from some of these cooking techniques, why they use like the animal lard and the tallow. Those are things Mm -hmm. that they had access to, right? So hopefully this was educational for you and you learned some things. Be careful with those oils. As we mentioned before, pick ones that are, have you know, the high cooking temp point. Um, If you are going to be cooking high heat, otherwise, you know, make sure that uh, everything that you are consuming is pretty well cooked, balanced, and, you know, consuming a lot of good omega-3s in addition to fruits, vegetables, antioxidants from a variety of foods. And this also allows you to enjoy your food more. Mm -hmm. So happy Wednesday. We'll be back on Friday. Thank you for listening to The Food Code. If this episode resonated with you, please share, rate, and review as this helps us reach others around the world. With that, thank you for listening. We'll be back soon. Love you guys.